All right, let's talk a little bit about tenant relations. And earlier, in case anybody let it slide through, I said having relations with your tenant, and that's not actually advisable because that's not what you want to get into. Talking about creating a relationship between you and your tenant, all right? You need to create a good relationship, but make sure that you're clear that you're the boss. And as a property manager, that you work for someone else. All right? And I would advise anybody that is a owner of property and you're managing your own property that you probably should still introduce yourself as the property manager. A lot of people want to get in caught up into this ego game about, yeah, I'm the owner, this is my property, yada, yada, yada. That's all fine and dandy, but you realize what the owner gets to do that a property manager can't do? Anybody? 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 Um, Bueller? Bueller? The owner gets to make decisions like, yeah, it's okay to be late, or yeah, I can reduce because you're having a hard time this month, where property managers do not, all right? Always be the property manager. Make sure you establish this relationship. I'm the manager. I work for someone else. I will be your representative and liaison between them. One of the other things that you shouldn't do also is never let them find out who the owner is because what ends up happening is sometimes they go around you. I've had that happen here just recently where a one of my tenants got a wild hair and did a tax search and found the owner and sent the owner a letter you know, asking permission to do something. And then, of course, the owner calls me and is like, what the hell's going on? I thought this is what I was paying you for. And I'm like, well, you know, I can't watch him. Um, if they found you somehow that it's agreement, I said, but we have to stand united here. Your answer should be back to this person. Deal with my property manager. Don't answer them because then that just feeds into their fire. Um, so you have to make sure that you understand and, and confer to them that there is a proper chain. It's me you with me, Mr. Tenant, and then I'll deal with the, talk to the client. Um, as an agent, that is your job anyway. Rent collection. Rent collection, you need to make sure you're consistent in all your methods. How do you collect rent? Is it something that, uh, and some, I've seen some people put it in um, the, the, the lease that you mail me the rent to this address and the rent must be received by this date. Now, it's amazing to me that in my 52 years, I have never lost a piece of mail except tenant's rent that was mailed to me. <laughs> okay, that was supposed to be humorous. Um, what I'm saying is, you at no time ever have I ever had somebody say, hey, I mailed you a birthday card and I didn't get it. Or, hey, I mailed you uh, a letter and I didn't get it. But you would be surprised the number of times I've, I went to a tenant's house and they go, well, I mailed the rent to you. It must have got lost in the mail. Yeah, okay. First of all, A, no. Second of all, why aren't you freaking out? Because here's the one concept. They seem to think that once they put it in the mail, they paid it. No. Once I receive it, I paid it. And that's why I don't really like mail. Um, I tell them because I don't want them to have that out, so to speak. I explained to them, it's when the rent gets to me. You choose to mail it and it gets lost, that's on you, babe. You know, now my landlord here in this space, um, I actually take my rent to him by hand, simply for that reason. I don't, I don't wanna, you know, lose it by mail. Now, I, obviously I'm not dumb enough to mail cash like I have seen some of my tenants do to me before. Um, I mailed a check. But just recently, he came to us and said, hey, would you like the availability to do it through uh, your credit card or a bank draft? I'm like, yeah, that would be really sweet. Not that I don't like going to see him, that he's a good guy. It's not even that far away. It's all around the corner over here. Um, but, you know, just a convenience. So he created this whole website that introduced um, us to pay. It's like 17 bucks convenience fee. Well, dude, at gas is now what? $2 a gallon? Um, I can be the inconvenienced as hell for 17 bucks. So I'm still going to mail him a check. Um, he has not said it's required yet. So he gave us the option. 
So I'm not going to use the electronic method. I'll just go do it in person. And you guys should keep that in mind. Now, most of the time, some of it, especially in apartment complexes, they've got drop boxes, uh, or someone can come in during the hours and, you know, pay. Um, I don't think they mail from the front of the apartment complex to the back of the complex. Um, they probably just drop it off. Um, I do like the convenience of using a bank draft, but not at 17 bucks. All right. Renewals. Do you have the power to renew? That is a very vital question. Is that one of the powers that we were given? Is it something my landlord or my owner says, I want the, to review and then I will tell you to extend a new lease to them or not? Or do we just simply say, hey, the lease is coming due. I'm going to extend the new lease. I tell my client, hey, I, we just kept that tenant in there because they're paying. You know, you have to understand that. What is your gig, so to speak? And once again, that comes about in all of that stuff that we had talked about earlier, whether you, um, in his objectives, are you given that power to do that? <clears throat> Is there a policy on renewals? Do you guys have a written policy? Let me tell you now, the answer better be yes. You know, if you're given the power to do the renewal, you better have a policy that says more than four lates in a 12 consecutive month, you do not get an automatic renewal. If you've been late zero, one or two times, you get an automatic renewal. Um, and in here, I've gotten renewals, and typically when I renew, it's based on the tenant's decision, providing the tenant is in good standing. That's the key. And that's, it says that in the lease, providing the tenant is in good standing. And good standing then goes on to define certain things. Now, I'm never late with my rent. I don't, not a lot of problems. Uh, but in the commercial world, it, it's a slightly different because I don't call. I do my own maintenance. I put that wall up there right behind you. Um, so when I renewed, basically my landlord said, hey, are you going to renew your lease? I said, yeah. He said, okay. So he sent me an extension over for three years. I just signed it and sent it back to him. Is that how it's going to happen with you guys? I don't know. You may have provisions that say, quote, finger quotes for you at home, in good standing means this, and therefore you must be, if you're in good standing, you can renew. All right. Well, with renewals comes rent increases. There are several different ways to look at rent increases. I've got a, well, it's actually one of my clients just had a 14 unit come on. I sent it over to him and said, hey, they, this is a one that fits your wheelhouse. Let's go look at it. And I called the, the owner of the property and said, hey, can you send me over? Is the market, is the rates, back up, tongue got ahead of me. Are the lease rates market rate? And he said, no. I'm like, well, okay, that's a good thing. As long as you're selling based on what you're collecting and not market rate. Um, he said, yeah, there's one lady that's been in there 10 years. And for the last eight years, her rent hadn't gone up. Well, hello, why not? The cost of everything else has gone up in the last 10 years or eight years. You know, why hasn't her rent increased? So there are several ways to, to handle that, you know. Once again, it could be a graduated lease. Your first year, it's this. Second year, it's this. Third year, it's this. Um, could be just based on some what they call CPI. They call this a bump, by the way. Uh, it's a bump in the rate. Could be a consumer price index. Okay, inflation's went up 2%. Your rent is going to go up 2% next year. Um, they also have these things called a nuisance raise. <laughs> A nuisance raise is a raise that is typically garnered by a new owner during the takeover of a new property. What he's going to do is come in and jack everybody's rent five bucks. All right. Now, you don't think that's a lot? Think about this. 20 units, that's five bucks. Five bucks times 20 units is $100 more a month. $100 times a year is $1,200 more a month. That's a $1,200 bonus, and all he did was raise everybody's rent five bucks. What about if he raised it 15 bucks? The reason it's called a nuisance raise is because it's high enough that people are going to go, well, screw him, but they're not going to move for 10 or $12 a month. All right? 
that's strategically done on purpose by a lot of new owners coming in and taking over. Your rent's going to go from 600 to 612 this month. So, you know, that's a 2% raise. There you go. 2% increase. And nobody's going to move. But if you're dealing with, let's do the asinine example. Suppose you're dealing with 120 or 130 units and you raise it uh, just $10. 130 units times $10, $1,300. Um, let's do 140 units. Math's way easier. That's $1,400 um, or 120 units. <laughs> yeah, who I can't add, so it doesn't really matter. 120 units is $1,200. $1,200 times 12 months, $14,400 increase. And if you're doing anything like a gross rent multiplier or a gross income multiplier of, say, eight or nine, you just raise the property value a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars by simply creating a nuisance raise. If you don't understand that math, stick with me or go check out the. Uh, class called Intro into Commercial Brokering, which you guys have access to as members of uh, Real University's members area, all right? Um, so that's ways to do the rent increases. What's next on our list? Terminating the tenancy. Oh, we just went through two of them. Let's do this. Terminating the tenancy. There's two ways to terminate the tenancy. Actual eviction and constructive eviction. Actual eviction is the landlord suing the tenant, which may be you, because that may be having a power that you have involved. And ironically, let me give you a good example. Um, I have a client that I represent that I have the power to go to court. And in Wayne Township in Indiana, all I needed was the signed management agreement from the owner saying that I could do that. And I went in small claims court for eviction. In Lawrence, Indiana, now I will tell you it has been a number of years, they would not let me at all because I was not the owner. They required the owner to show up in person or hire an attorney. Real big pain in the ass in Lawrence Township. All right. So if you have to go to court, you may end up in uh, terminating tenancy by court. And what you're looking for is this suit for possession. Suit for possession means I want to get my house back because ultimately that is what we are looking for when a tenant violates the lease. Now, anytime they breach the lease, you could seek remedy for any violation. Most notably, what's the number one violation that we seek relief from? Anybody? Yeah, they didn't pay their rent. But the reality is you could actually have other reasons they've breached their lease. I had one where the judge asked me, well, how far are they behind you? And I said, they're current, Your Honor. And he about broke his neck looking at me. He's like, what the hell? Um, he didn't really say that, but he probably would have. I said, well, they're violating the zoning because they're running a business out of there and violating the zoning rules. Plus, they've had pets when the lease said strictly no pets, and now they've caused damage to my house, and I won the eviction. That's actual eviction, suit for possession, all right? There is also another one called constructive eviction. This is where the tenant, <coughs> this is where the tenant evicts themselves, so to speak, okay? What I mean by that is, because the property has become uninhabitable, and that is the key. The property must be uninhabitable and fail to be remedied by the landlord in a reasonable amount of time. So, you know, for instance, you can't say, hey, there's a hole in the roof and you're not here in the next 10 minutes, I'm moving out. Um, you know, that might be a bad example because that is pretty drastic. Um, let's say, you know, windows won't lock or something like that. If they fail after numerous attempts, the landlord fails, or the property manager, you guys can be held liable for this as well, fails to fix it, then yeah. But I mean, if they call and say, hey, I was out there, and they come out the next day, they can't say, oh, yeah, you, you took a day. No, it's got to be reasonable. Um, constructive eviction means the tenant virtually has evicted themselves. The property has become uninhabitable, and as such they need to vacate the property and therefore they are terminating the lease 
and there's going to be no more due. I had a tenant claim this once, and, you know, and, and the judge is like, what's going on? And that the other person goes, basically, they said, Your Honor, I want to claim constructive eviction. And I'm like, chick, you can't even spell constructive eviction, let alone know what it is. Who you been talking to? So he asked her one question. He said, are you still living in the property? She said, well, yeah, but we're trying to get out. He said, denied because it must be uninhabitable for you to vacate the property, and then that is constructive eviction, okay? Now, as a property manager, I don't have it on my notes here, but I also want to talk about the 45-day letter. You guys better know about the 45-day letter um, in the residential world. You have to send a letter to your tenant when they move out, within 45 days after move out, explaining to them where the earnest money is, and itemizing where it's going. If you're keeping it, and you can't just say, I'm keeping all $900. You have to say 200 to here, 300 to here, 400 to here. Yeah, that totals 900. Or that totals 1,000, I'm keeping the 900, and you owe me another 100. Or it totals 600, and here's your 300 back. Or it totals nothing, and here's your 900 back. Failure to do any of those is a violation on your part okay failure to send this letter even if you think well they're getting no money back it doesn't matter because that's even more important because if that guy knows that he um this rule that tenant knows the rule and you fail to send the letter to him he's going to go to court and he can get his money back even if he leveled the friggin place okay now, there is a couple keys to this. One is the tenant has to give you written uh, forwarding address. So if they beat you in the middle of the night, like a midnight move, and you have no forwarding address, you don't know where they're at, they're in the wind, here's what I would still suggest you do, people. Listen up, put your phone away. <laughs> it's not like it's my kid now. Put your phone away. Watch me. Look at me. Shut up. Don't say that. Um, Send a 45-day letter to their last known address, which is where? Yeah, that's right, your freaking property, all right? So then when it either gets returned or forwarded or left in your mailbox, you actually have a copy of it. Now, there used to be, and I, I don't know if it still does this, if the person actually went through the post office and forwarded their mail, which probably is not going to happen, otherwise they wouldn't have beat you for the rent anyway, I mean, it doesn't matter, and you put forward uh, return mail requested, they will tell you where they forwarded to, so now you've got that address. So that also works out because you need their address for um, damages in the court case. So if they beat you uh, in the midnight move and you can't obviously sue them for damages, you also can't get the 45-day letter, all right? Any questions about terminating? Oh, well, here's one other thing I want to tell you that you guys need to know this. Um, judge won't tell you this. Let's say you had a tenant beat you and they're in the wind. They did a midnight move. You went in and they're gone. You've got possession of the property and you go to court. You can actually waive your suit for possession and go straight to damages if you're allowed to be in court, obviously, as a property manager. Waive your suit for possession. I've got the property. I don't need you to evict them. What I want to do is today, I want to go straight to the damages, save me one court trip down here and one court case filing. Now, the key to that is you have to be ready that day. So if you say, hey, Your Honor, I want to waive my right to suit for possession and I want to go straight to damages, the judge will say, okay, uh, since you're smart enough to know that, I will grant you that permission. How much are damages? You can't say, okay, well, let me get back with you. No, you better be right. Okay, here, I've already done the itemized bill, yada, yada, yada. I want to, I'm suing for 900 a bucks, and I'm keeping his 700 in, uh, earnest money and 200 more. All right? So you've got to be ready when you waive your suit to possession. But you can do that, and that's something that a judge is never going to tell you uh, you can do that because he can't give you legal advice. He's just there to rule on what you decide. So you have to know to ask for, wait for my suit for possession. I already have the property, Your Honor. And the Lawrence County judge, or Lawrence Township, which I'm not a real big fan of because he wouldn't let me go to court, um, his determination of had a person vacated the property was toothbrush and mattress. That was his uh, bed clothing. 
as a general is what he said actually. If their toothbrush is gone and their bed clothing is gone, they vacated the property. All right, any questions about tenant relations? We're going to talk about maintenance coming up. Take a small break. Um, if you need to use cell phones, now's the time. For those of you at home, just catch us on the other side.